you will, take your Bible and turn with me to Psalm 92. We're spending a few Sundays in the Psalms and and sort of a break from our study in Romans. And I thought this would be a most appropriate Psalm as we have Thanksgiving just a few days past. Before coming to the text this morning there in Psalm 92, I want to read to you a prayer from a book that we gave away just a few years ago to most people within the congregation on a Sunday morning. It's a collection of Puritan prayers and devotions that I think if you're paying attention, you'll hear us reference occasionally called the Valley of Vision. And the prayer that I want to read to you is called Praise and Thanksgiving. And again, I think that's appropriate for the last few days. And I would just ask as I'm reading this to you that you would listen to what the writer is saying that you would listen to how he's praising God, how he's given thanks to God, and listen for the one request that he makes. From the Valley of Vision, praise and thanksgiving. O oh my God, thou fairest, greatest, first of all objects, my heart admires, adores, loves thee, for my vessel is as full as it can be, and I would pour out all that fullness before thee in ceaseless flow. When I think upon and converse with thee, ten thousand delightful thoughts spring up. Ten thousand sources of pleasure are unsealed. Ten thousand refreshing joys spread over my heart, crowding into every moment of happiness. I bless thee, and now listen, reasons why he blesses thee, for the soul thou hast created for adorning it, sanctifying it, though it is fixed in barren soil. For the body thou hast given me, for preserving its strength and vigor, for providing senses to enjoy delights, for the ease and freedom of my limbs, for hands, eyes, ears that do thy bidding, for thy royal bounty providing my daily support, for a full table and overflowing cup, for appetite, taste, sweetness, for social joys of relatives and friends, for ability to serve others, for a heart that feels sorrows and necessities, for a mind to care for my fellow men, for opportunities of spreading happiness around, for loved ones in the joys of heaven, for my own expectation of seeing thee clearly. He says, I love thee above the powers of language to express for what thou art to thy creatures, And here's your one request. Increase my love, O my God, through time and eternity. I appreciate the Valley of Vision, and I think like most of you do, because sometimes it gives you words where you just don't have any words really to pray, and when words escape you. But I also appreciate the Valley of Vision and prayer such as that because they lead us and they teach us how to give praise and how to give thanks to God. They direct us in some ways, in places where we might not be tended to go. And I think you heard that in the things that were said in that prayer as to why he thanks God. To thank God for your senses. How often are you coming before God in prayer saying, thank you that I can smell and taste and touch and see. It provides here for us an example of how to pray, how to worship God through prayer. And the psalm that we're going to look at this morning here, Psalm 92, does much the same thing. Look at the subscript of that psalm. This is a song it says here, it tells us, for the Sabbath day. A psalm, a song for the Sabbath day. No other psalm in the Psalter there has that same description telling us its use here being intended for the Sabbath, directing believers in Sabbath worship. So this is for a Thanksgiving day in a corporate sense that was weekly, not annually, as we've just celebrated, where you're coming to worship and you're coming to praise God. And put yourself sort of here within the context of what's going on. The Mishnah tells us, as it regards this psalm, that it was sung by the Levites in the temple. That as you came near the temple on the day set aside to worship Yahweh, in the morning, During the time of sacrifices that would take place there, the worshiper of the Most High coming to the temple would hear this song of thanksgiving that would direct the rest of their day. Look at Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. 
to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. With a ten-stringed lute and with a harp, with the resounding music upon the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by what you have done. I will sing for joy at the works of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man has no knowledge, <clears throat> nor does a stupid man understand this, that when the wicked sprouted up like grass and all who did iniquity flourished, it was only that they might be destroyed forevermore. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies will perish. All who do iniquity will be scattered. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil, and my eye has looked exultantly upon my foes. My ears hear of the evildoers who rise up against me. The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. So this is a psalm that glorifies God in worship by reminding us it's right to praise him. It's good to give him thanks. All while also leading us and teaching us to praise him by laying out reasons for praising him. It's a wonderful example of a God-honoring expression here of praise and thanksgiving coming from a righteous person. And it shows us that the joy and the privilege of praising God belongs to the righteous. The joy and privilege of praising God belongs to the righteous. And it helps you then as a righteous person made righteous through Christ to take hold of that privilege. It leads us here in praise. It teaches us to praise by example, by providing the grounds for praising God, the reasons for praising God that are coming here from the psalm itself. And the first reason that he gives us, number one, is the rightness expressed in verses one through three, the rightness expressed. That the psalm opens here with a declaration that the most appropriate endeavor to undertake for a believer is to give thanks and praise to Yahweh. It's leading you and it's teaching you by showing you what is right. Look at those first verses. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. What's he doing? He's saying, hey, this is what's good. This is what's appropriate. This is what's right. This is what you ought to be doing if you're a righteous person. The word good there means what's pleasing, what's desirable, what's favorable, what's right. So if you were to ask God, well, what's a fitting thing for a believer to do? What's a fitting action for a believer? I think he'd point you to the psalm. It gives you the answer here in verses 1 and 2. This is in accord then with the will of God. This is what his word says. Three parts there that are good. To give thanks, to sing praise, to declare. And let's just consider each of those. To give thanks. That from your mouth, as a believer, would come this confession, recognizing what Yahweh has done, and expressing that you're appreciative for what he has done for you. Now, why would a believer do this? Why would you thank him? Well, let's let Scripture answer that question in a number of ways. The first way that Scripture answers that question that we could look at comes from Psalm 33, verses 1 and 2, where it says, Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming of the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings. It says this is becoming. This is, again, appropriate. It's fitting. It's right for you to do. It's suitable. It's proper. In such a way, you were created for this very purpose, and you were saved for this very purpose, as he's changed your heart, and he's inserted a different heart, a heart of flesh that's able to praise him and to recognize why he ought to be praised. This is becoming of the upright. Psalm 54, verse 6, gives us another reason. It says, I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. This is a delight for his creatures to give praise to his name and give thanks to his name, the name of the creator here. It's the most excellent response that's going to honor him. This is a good thing. Psalm 107 gives us another reason. 
Psalm 107 verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. So the psalmist is saying there, it's good that you give him thanks because of the intrinsic nature, this quality of his goodness. But that's not the only component you could give him thanks for. Psalm 107 verse 8, verse 15 and verse 22 also say, let them give thanks to the Lord, not only for his good, but his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Well, we could add to all of this with Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, where Paul is thanking God because he has supplied all of his needs according to the riches that are found in Christ. And you could add to that even more from Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 through 15, where Paul's not only thankful that the, that the church has provided for his needs and that God has used them to provide for him in such a way, providing all of what is needed for ministry, but also because he's given us his grace through salvation. So the Bible is enough to provide examples of those who are acknowledging what they have from God and expressing appreciation for it, thanking him for it. And the psalmist is telling you here in Psalm 92 verse 1, that's a most appropriate response. Take that understanding of this is what's good, this is what's right, this is what's proper, this is what's appropriate, and let's look at that in view of our life. But there are expressions of thanksgiving coming from you. Now certainly, as it regards our needs, I think we're fairly quick to come before God and tell him all the things that we need. I think the interesting thing from the, the, from the Valley of Vision prayer that I read to you a moment ago was just how out of balance that seemed probably to most of our lives, myself including, where he just expressed praise for this, for this, for this, for this, and then one item there at the end said, this is what I'm requesting from you, God. I think this is helpful to bring balance to our prayers and thanksgiving as we come before God in prayer. Now, I'm not rebuking anybody for coming and bringing your needs to God. Certainly, we need to be doing that, and the Psalms also provide an example of doing that. But here, much like that prayer that I read to you earlier, you find that the focus is weighted towards what we might tend to neglect, recognizing there what Yahweh has done and expressing gratitude for him because of all of it. That we might be able to say, what we know to be true from Scripture, Father, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that you created me. I'm thankful that you demonstrated your patience towards me when I was lost, that you showed me grace, that you showed me mercy, that I can confess I did not deserve, that you sent your beloved son to die for me, that my faith has come from you. You gave me faith. You gave me new life in him. And that as I'm a new creature here right now that you're sanctifying me, you're maturing me, you're the one that's forming Christ in me. I'm even thankful, Father, hold on, that you're sending trials my way that are drawing me closer to you. I'm thankful for the church that you've allowed me to be a part of where I can grow and where I can love others and where I can experience love from others. But what I'm getting at is this, can you recognize what you always done? that you might tend to overlook because you have to be able to do that in order to express appreciation to him. <clears throat> if you want a bit of a homework assignment as, as you go from here today from Psalm 92, here's your homework assignment. Knowing it's good to give thanks to Yahweh, the text says so, go home, pull out a pen, pull out a piece of paper, write those words, Father, I am thankful that you and begin to give some serious thought to what God has done for you begin to list them out from creating you to giving you your senses that enjoy taste and smell and sight to surrounding you with family and friends to saving your soul through Jesus Christ, his son. I want you to, to grasp this because so often within our prayers we're asking, Lord, what's your will for my life? This is his will for your life. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do you ever think about that when you want to know what's God's will for my life? Should I buy this toothpaste or that toothpaste, right? Which restaurant should I go to? God tells you what his will is for your life, to give thanks, to give thanks to him. It is good, the text says, to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praise to your name, O Most High. What's a fitting undertaking for the believer? Number two, it's to give to sing praise. The, the words there mean to make music. 
In verse 3, he gives you the instruments, right? He gives you these instruments that are, that are added here to, to make music praising the Most High. You know what that name means, the Most High, because last week we considered that name of God that's used here, El Yon. That's the name that speaks of him being elevated, of being higher than all else, supreme in sovereignty, majestic in rule. He is the highest authority. And it is most appropriate for believers to make music to sing, being this external response that's coming out of us in regards to the Most High. Because he is most high and because Paul recognizes this, that he is sovereign, he is elevated in this way, this is the reason that the psalmist is singing. In Scripture, if you look through Scripture, it's songs that are filling the mouths of his people that are recognized in this. From Moses singing in the desert, there in Exodus 15 and Deuteronomy 32 in response to what God has done, to the psalm here, Psalm 92, leading worshipers to sing praise to him, to Paul in Ephesians 5, 19 through 20, telling Christians to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things. The psalmist says in Psalm 89, verse 1, I will sing of the loving kindness of the Lord forever. To all generations I will make known, coming out of me in such a way, your faithfulness with my mouth. This is most appropriate. To give thanks, to sing praise. Number three, to declare. Look at verse 2. To declare your loving kindness in the morning and to declare your faithfulness by night. And then he goes on with the instruments. To declare here is to announce, to tell, to report that it is your joy to worship God by being a herald of the truth about him to other people in this world. That's a way in which you worship. To declare, to announce, to tell. Psalm 71, verse 17 and 18 reads, O oh God, you have taught me from my youth, and I still declare your wondrous deeds. And even when I am old and gray, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to all who are to come. On his mind is that whatever generation God has called him to be a part of, his duty and his joy is to praise God by declaring who God is and what God has done. So part of praising God is to announce and to tell others about him. In verse 2, look at what that is, to declare his loving kindness and his faithfulness. Loving kindness, there is that word that you're familiar with, has said, his covenant-keeping love, that he's faithful to all that he has promised, that he's loyal in his love to his people, that his love is steadfast and unconditional and directed to those whom he has chosen to have a relationship with. Psalm 89 verse 1 says, I will sing, I will sing of the loving kindness of the Lord forever. So two parts here, loving kindness and faithfulness. This is his steadfastness, his faithfulness, his fidelity. And think about what scripture tells you about his faithfulness. It tells you, Isaiah 49 verse 7, that it's an essential part of his nature and that it's because of his faithfulness that he chooses to act out his will. It directs his actions. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 23 says that his faithfulness is great. Those words you're familiar with, great is your faithfulness. Psalm 89 verse 8, that his faithfulness is incomparable. Verse 33, that it's unfailing. Psalm 36, verse 5, that it's infinite, that there is no end to his faithfulness. In Psalm 119 and Psalm 146, that his faithfulness is everlasting. Now, if you go back and you read through those texts, one thing that you're going to find is that they often describe his faithfulness and his loving kindness together, like you find here in Psalm 92, that they're intrinsically linked into one another, as such they are, into this compound expression that's the foundation for his covenantal promises, particularly you see that there in Psalm verse chapter 89. So, so I want you to think about it for a moment. Why is it so important that we would declare his loving kindness and his faithfulness in the morning and in the night, as you see here, covering what? All times in which we are awake. All times in which you're able to declare as it is. Well, I'll give you 15 reasons, okay? And we'll do this in rapid fire order. You don't have to write them all down. You can ask me later, I'll give them to you. But just thinking through this, why is it good to declare his loving kindness and his faithfulness? One, 
It champions your glorious God's nature. It champions his nature as to who he is and how he's distinct from all others. Number two, it commands you to trust him. He is the one who is loving. He is the one who is faithful. Number three, it convicts you of your tendency to downplay those natures, those attributes of his, or to forget them altogether and live out your life as though they're not true. Number four, it compels you to cling to what is true. It is true, and as we declare those things, we cling to those elements that are true. Number five, it cures you of the temptation to act as though his loving kindness and his faithfulness are not true. Too often we tend to act like that. Number six, it calms your troubled heart. When your heart is all stirred up and troubled, we need to be reminded of who he is that we're declaring here that's coming out of our mouth. Number seven, it captivates our attention. It directs our minds towards him. Number eight, it challenges and it corrects your emotions. We talked a bit about emotions last week. Sometimes it doesn't always feel like he's loving, kind, like he's loving and he's faithful. This is correcting that. Number nine, it cheers your lowly or disheartened spirit. Number 10, it cleanses you of unbiblical thoughts or presuppositions. Number 11, it constructs a true and biblical understanding of God in your mind. Number 12, it crushes your enemy's attempts to tell you that he isn't loving and he isn't faithful. Number 13, it centers your understanding of God on Scripture itself and just not whatever's floating around in your head. Number 14, it carries you through times of trouble and trial. And number 15, it celebrates the person of God by glorifying his name. Now, I bet most of you have given up somewhere on that list of writing those down, right? Ask me later, I'll give them to you. The point is that there's innumerable reasons why we ought to be declaring his loving kindness and his faithfulness. The only real question is why you would not. Why would you not declare the loving kindness and faithfulness of the Most High God? James Montgomery Boyce said, quote, Worshiping God is a glorious, splendid, delightful, and most reasonable thing to do. And isn't that the point of Psalm 92? Isn't that the very truth that he's giving us there at the opening of the psalm? Christian, are you regularly found pursuing what verse 1 says is a fitting action for a believer and that is in accord with the will of God for you? giving thanks, singing praise, declaring who he has revealed himself to be. Is that what fills your days? Is that what fills your night as you're laying there in bed trying to go to sleep? As it fills your mind whenever you're waking up early in the morning and wondering why in the world am I waking up at this time? Does it fill your conversations at work? Does it fill your conversations at home as you're talking with different family members? Fill your conversations as you gather with your spouse and your children and your grandchildren. Do they see you giving thanks? Do they see you praising God most high? And, and is it coming from your heart with joy? Or are you looking at this going, well, it's a duty, so I've got to go do that. I think if you're reading Psalm 92, the one thing that you're going to see very clearly is this is a joy for the psalmist to do because his heart has been changed. So Psalm 92 leads us in praise. It teaches us to praise by giving us the grounds for praising God, with the first being it's appropriate to express praise and thanksgiving to God. The second is the joy revealed, the joy revealed in verses 4 and 5. Verses 4 and 5 show us that the psalmist is filled with joy, legitimate joy, because he knows what the Lord has done. This is all coming from a person who has been made glad. Look at verse 4. For you, O Yahweh, have made me glad by what you have done. I will sing for joy at the works of your hand. How great are your works, O Yahweh. Your thoughts are very deep. Did you catch what's repeated there? If you're paying attention to those two verses, what's repeated is what Yahweh has done, what the Lord has done, his works, what you have done, the works of your hands, your works. So the works here of the Lord are a source of joy, leading the righteous man to sing his praise. And the very first work described there that the Lord has done is he's made the psalmist glad. He's caused him to be delighted, satisfied, rejoicing. And so he's declaring and confessing here in song this truth, and it's the whole reason that he's singing. 
If you were to look through scripture, think about this as it regards the very thing that he's talking about here and, and ask it, what does it tell us about the works of God? What is it that you find? Psalm 66 verse 30, his works are awesome. Psalm 104 verse 24, they're many and they're made in wisdom. Psalm 111 verse 2, they're great. Revelation verse, chapter 15 verse 3, they're marvelous. In Psalm 111 verse 2, it also says, they are studied by all who delight in them. He is a student of Scripture. He's a student of the works of God. And they're a source of his gladness and joy. The psalmist knows the works of the Lord is creating everything from nothing, his making and keeping promises, his flooding the world, his preserving a remnant, his blessing Joseph in Egypt, his rescuing Israel from Egypt, and the list could go on and on and on, but consider for a moment when you think about this guy writing this psalm that you know way more about what the Lord has done in the sense than what the psalmist knew. Christian, you know how God sent his son as a perfect, sufficient sacrifice for your sin. You know his work of raising his son to life after he gave his life on the cross. And you know of his exalting his son in glory. In that sort of a way, you know of the works of God that really sort of exceed, because you have more detail, that, that exceed what the psalmist knew here. And among the whole myriad of works that you could attest to, by which all of us could echo those words of the psalmist, O Lord, you have made me glad by what you have done. Friend, surely his saving, his redeeming, his rescuing you has filled you with joy. What he has done through his son has filled you with joy. I just wonder if you have an absence of joy and you think about what the text is saying here. Do you know what God has done for you? I I could see how those two things could relate. Why? Am I so depressed? Why am I so lacking in joy? Well, how often are you giving your attention to what God has done? Do you know how he's changed your heart? Has he changed your heart? They're linked together here. Now look, to further add and to complement his works and deeds in verse 4 and 5, the psalmist says that his thoughts are very deep. So not only is it his works that are a source of joy, but his thoughts are a source of joy for his people and their reason to praise him and to thank him. And you just think again about what Scripture says about God's thoughts. Psalm 94, his thoughts are not like a man's thoughts that are a mere breath. Isaiah 59, his thoughts are not your thoughts, neither his ways your ways. As far as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than your ways and his thoughts than your thoughts. Psalm 139 says that the sum of his thoughts are vast. You remember Romans 11, 33, they're unfathomable and unsearchable. Psalm 139, verse 7, his thoughts are precious to his people. One commentator wrote, here lies the difference between God and his human creatures. They can neither penetrate the mind of God nor fully comprehend the acts of his love. This is why it's critical that you know Scripture if you want to have joy because it's from Scripture that you see what God has done and you get a glimpse of his thoughts, both being here a wellspring of joy, a wellspring of gladness that are leading you to praise him, that are leading you to thank him for who he is. The psalmist is teaching us how God's thoughts and God's deeds make us glad and result in our praising him. And the psalmist is leading us to praising God by causing us to consider, again, what he has done and the wisdom behind his design as a stimulant to incite praise in us. So these are the grounds for praising God. It's appropriate, and it's a result of joy. Number three, verses six through nine, the foolishness explained. The foolishness explained. The psalmist in those verses explains the foolishness of thinking that the wicked will endure. This is a foolishness that is going to prevent a man from praising God. Look at verse 6. A senseless man has no knowledge, nor does a stupid man understand this, that when the wicked sprouted up like grass and all who did iniquity flourished, it was only that they might be destroyed forevermore. He's describing a senseless man here. The the literal translation would be the word brute in some sense. 
the one who thinks and therefore sort of acts like an animal. Think Nebuchadnezzar grazing in the field. Now, I think we don't have a whole lot of people grazing in a field like Nebuchadnezzar was grazing in a field. We have a whole lot of people who have the same sort of a mind as it regards the things of God. They're senseless. They're, I'm just using the words of the text, okay? Parents who say, tell your kids, don't say stupid. Okay, don't say stupid. But the text actually says stupid here. These are stupid men. They lack understanding. And what is it that they do not know? The text says they don't recognize the temporary nature of their wicked. In their perspective, the senseless, stupid man here thinks that the wicked are deep-rooted and that they're going to keep accomplishing all of their wicked intent without ever being caught. But from the psalmist's perspective, who knows truth, he describes them kind of like you would describe the weeds in your garden, that the spring rains come along and all of a sudden all these weeds show up but they're not going to last for long because you're going to pluck them out of your garden. They will not inflict the harm that they intend to harm amongst the plants that you intend to stay and grow and to flourish. For a moment, it looks like they're well and healthy and everything is going to be fine, but they will not last. So, as you're looking at the unrighteous this way, you see the distinction between their works and the works of Yahweh that we just looked at. His works are lasting. His works are worthy of praise. Their works are not reason to rob you of praising his name. Their works describe here, what are they going to do? It's like they're going to wither away. It's sort of like they're the dry tree branch that you break off and you can see that it's distinctly different from the tree that's alive. This is not well. This is not healthy. It's going to be removed. It has a short life. The difference between you and what's described here is the senseless man doesn't know that. A man who knows no more of spiritual realities than an animal, if you will, thinks that the wicked are always going to flourish, always going to grow stronger, always going to endure. But what's the corrective? What's missing from that sort of a faulty theology? It's what's at the very center of the psalm right here in verse 8. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. Yahweh's the corrective in this. He reigns eternally. He governs sovereignly. He rules authoritatively. And evil will not go unpunished, Proverbs eleven twenty one. 21. The wicked will weather one day. They will weather as quickly as the grass when the rain stop. And they will come to know that the Most High who lives forever is worthy of praise and honor. It's sort of, again, like Nebuchadnezzar when he came to his senses, Daniel chapter 4, verse 34, who was able to then profess, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. So again, pay attention to the psalm. This is a way in which the psalmist is leading us and teaching us to praise God by showing us the foolishness of not praising him, by showing us the foolishness of thinking that the wicked will endure. So Christian, you even have grounds for praising God that are found in a verse such as this. Any opposition to him is going to be met with the downfall of whoever attempts such a foolish endeavor. Just note verse 9. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies will perish. All who do iniquity will be scattered. They are going to come to a final end. They're not going to flourish forever. They're not going to grow forever. This isn't going to go on forever. Christian, I think of anybody, you know this, and you need to be reminded of this. The reason you know this is because you know the reality that the power of sin and death had over you. You know the reality of that coming to an end through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the power of God to end the tyranny of the enemy, you know this. It once seemed like its grip was forever on you, but because he defeated sin, he released you from its grip. You have a new heart. He's filled you with his spirit. Now you are a new man or woman who is free from sin's tyranny over you. You understand that that's not forever. And if you are a Christian, you can praise God that sin's tyranny in you has not lasted forever, while at the same time praising God that sin's tyranny in the world will not last forever, and the wicked will not go on forever. 
So quit acting like they will. Quit talking like they will. Christian, you don't possess the perspective of the senseless man. You possess the perspective of a man who has a renewed mind and a transformed heart, who has experienced the joy of knowing the Lord who reigns on high and who ends the flourishing of the wicked. The grounds for thanking and praising God. One, the righteousness expressed. Two, the joy revealed. Three, the foolishness explained. And four, the grace recognized. Verses 10 through 11, the grace recognized. In verse 10 through 11, the psalmist recognizes God's grace upon his life, which again serves as another basis for praising him. Verse 10, but you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eye has looked exultantly upon my foes. My ears hear of the evildoers who rise up against me. What's he doing? He's going through a list of what the Lord has done on his behalf that demonstrates grace. One, he's exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. The exalted horn is an expression of his divine favor upon him, that God has lifted up the horn, if you will, and he is compared here to this powerful creature that's often referred to in a proverbial sense of that which is strong and mighty. This is a way in which the psalmist is describing how the Lord's blessed him and provided for him and shown favor upon his life. And then what's the second way? Has anointed with fresh oil. Again, this is God who's acting here, showing us this is God's man, his favor and his blessing and his approval and his hand rest upon the psalmist here. He recognizes it. He says his eye has looked exultantly upon his foes. He's seen victory over those in the past who are seeking to destroy him and wreck his life. And all the reason that he knows that victory, he attributes here, this is God's favor upon me. And even now he hears that those who rise up against him, there's no fear in him because God's hand rests upon him. No enemy is going to prevent him from praising and thanking God. Now, now watch verse 10 and 11 here. He's looking around. He's recognizing the innumerable ways in which God has mercifully and graciously dealt with him. And it's leading him to praise and thanksgiving. Each of those actions by God that he describes, the way in which the Lord has blessed him, exalting my horn, anointing with oil, those are demonstrations of grace. He recognizes God's grace upon his life. What God has done for him that he has not merited he has not earned this he does not deserve this he's recognizing that it's coming out of his mouth he's declaring it so again the psalmist is leading and teaching us to give thanks to and praise to god by recognizing his grace let's apply what you find here in psalm 92 can you recognize god's grace upon your life can you recognize his grace upon your life? What's he lifted you up from? What's he raised you out of? In what way has he shown you his favor and his blessing? Again, if you return to the prayer of thanksgiving from the Valley of Vision, what's evident in that prayer is that the writer recognizes God's grace in ways that we often minimize or that we overlook. He's thankful he's been graciously been given the ability to move his eyes and his limbs that he can see, that he can hear. So often the only time you come to the place where you're thankful that you're able to see and that you're able to hear and that you're able to move is when you can't see, can't see, and you are not able to move. But before that, he recognizes this is God's grace upon him. He recognizes God's grace, remember, that his table is full, that he's physically nourished, and that his needs are met. It's God's grace, he said in that, that prayer, that he has friends, that he can serve others, that he has opportunities to spread happiness. If we get anything out of Psalm 92, I hope it's this, that that's the way that we think. And that's the way that we respond, recognizing grace in my life where I fail to see it because it seems so ordinary and it seems so obvious. Christian, do you recognize the grace of God upon you 
even as you sat here this morning and you look around this room, that you have friends here, real friends in person that you can look at face to face and speak to, that you have opportunities to serve others in the body of Christ, that you have the joy of real lasting relationships between brothers and sisters who care for you and who you have the opportunity to care for and to encourage and that can do all of those with you if you'll let them. Christian, he has shown you unmerited favor. He has shown you grace. Can you recognize it? And I haven't even mentioned the grace that he's shown you through the gospel, grace that not only saved you and gave you life, but that removed the veil from your eyes so that you can see grace in ways that you were never able to see grace before. Do you recognize his grace? Because when you do, it leads you to praising him and thanking him because he is a gracious God. Number five, in those final verses, the destiny anticipated. The destiny anticipated. So what Yahweh has done was recognized by the psalmist and led him to praise. Now, watch what he's saying here. This is an anticipation of Yahweh's loving kindness and faithfulness that's going to show itself in the years to come. He anticipates the destiny of the righteous. Listen to what he's saying in these final verses of what he anticipates that lies ahead of him in verse 12. The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green. What he is describing there is spiritual vitality that only is going to increase in the years ahead. The years are not something that he dreads here, but something that he anticipates of service and that service being of praising Yahweh. One, he will flourish like the palm tree. Flourish there is the word to bud or to sprout. The whole idea is that he will continue to exhibit signs of life like a palm tree that in itself was symbolic of strength and growth in a most hostile environment of the desert. Number two, that he will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. He's not going to decrease as years go away. He's not going to become spiritually weak, but he's going to become spiritually strong. He's not going to wither or decay. He's not going to fade, but he's going to grow. And the growth that he describes here is like the greatest and strongest possible tree that he knew in his world. And like a tree having been planted, look at that, near his God. Verse 13, planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. He is describing his proximity to God as connected to his flourishing and his growth. Friend, I don't think it matters this morning whether you're a younger saint or an older saint. That ought to be encouraging to you, what you find in verse 14. Look at those words, will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green not withered, not dry, not a decaying tree. You want to know what those words literally mean if you were to translate them without thinking in sort of, sort of sense of any context? That you would be fat and juicy. Nobody's sitting here going, I want to be fat and juicy, right? But you do if the opposite is to be dry and withered away. The, the whole idea is that you're not a dead branch. That there is life in you, even at the point where you're kind of wondering, would there still be life at this point? It, it conveys that you're luxuriant and that you're fresh. The Lord ultimately has continuing plans for this tree. There is a future for this tree. And isn't that different than the temporary nature of the weeds that we looked at a moment ago? That they would be plucked out, that their life was short, totally different here. There is a life where you would almost wonder, would there still be life? There is a vitality to this tree that's not what you might expect at this point in life. But what does it attest to? This is God's tree. It's planted in God's court. It possesses a life that only God can give to it. Its whole existence here is attesting to the greatness and to the glory of God. What does that lead you to? He is leading you to praise him, to thank him, 
to be thankful even for what is coming that has not yet come. What's coming? Look at the text. He describes more joyful declaration on his part so that not only does the tree and the life in the tree here attest to the greatness and glory of God that's worthy of praise, but the tree itself continues to praise and thank God. What does still still yielding fruit in old age look like? What does it mean to be full of sap and very green? What does it mean to be fat and juicy in old age? Verse 15, to declare. Takes you all the way back to verse 2. To declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, there is no unrighteousness in him. Still praising God. Still praising the most high in old age. He has endured. Is there a precedent for what's being told to us there in Psalm 92? I think there is, and I think it comes in Deuteronomy 32. In Moses' last days, what do you find him doing? He is singing. Deuteronomy 34 verse 7 says that although Moses was 120 years old, when he died, his eye was not dim nor his vigor abated. And he departs this world, this life, still yielding fruit. He departs this life giving thanks, singing praise, declaring the loving kindness and faithfulness of Yahweh. In Deuteronomy 32, he he sounds a bit like an inspired version of Valley of Vision. He's leading and he's teaching the people there of Israel to give thanks and to sing praise to Yahweh. In verse 31, or chapter 31 of Deuteronomy, verse 30, it says he spoke these words of this song. He's singing. And and if you were to go through that, if you want more homework, go home and look through Deuteronomy 32. And what you'll find is he's expressing the rightness of praising Yahweh. He's revealing the joy of praising his name. He's singing. It is a song. He's explaining the foolishness of the wicked in Deuteronomy 32. He recognizes the grace of God upon his life and that of the people of Israel in verses 6 through and following. And he anticipates the destiny that is going to come in Deuteronomy 33. But just consider for a moment how the song leader of Israel in the last days of his life opens this song. And at the same time, remember those words that are closing out Psalm 92. To declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, there is no unrighteousness in him. This is what Moses sings. Deuteronomy 32 verse 2. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew as the droplets on the fresh grass and as the showers on the herb. For I proclaim the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, for all of his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. His days are coming to an end on this earth and he is flourishing. His days are coming to an end on this earth and he is very much alive. And he is declaring the Lord is upright. He is my rock. There is no unrighteousness in him. I pray that each of us would sound a lot like Moses in whatever days we have. Giving thanks, singing praise, declaring that the Lord is upright, that he is my God, my rock. And that this would come out of us even to our final breath in this world. Christian, all the way back to the beginning, the joy and privilege of of praising God belong to the righteous. The joy and privilege of praising God belongs to the righteous. And Psalm 92 is leading us and teaching us to praise him and to give him thanks. May we affirm that it is right to praise him. And may we experience the joy of God's work that's moving us to praise. And may we attest to the foolishness of not rendering praise. And may we consider his grace. And may that lead us to praise his name. But don't also let us forget to anticipate the destiny that awaits us. That's worthy of opening our mouth and declaring he is our rock. And he is worthy of praise. Father, we're grateful to be able to consider the psalm this morning. Your word has taught us, and your word leads us to giving thanks to you. You created the world, and you created everything in it by your majestic and your powerful hand. 
Father, whether it's the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, the health that we enjoy, the roof that we find shelter under, the clothes that we wear, the family that we're a part of, the church that we're blessed with, we confess that it's because of you, because you have been gracious. So we thank you and we praise your most holy name. We gather together this morning to give you thanks, to sing praise to the Most High, and to declare your loving kindness and your faithfulness. It's evident in you having saved us, and you having clothed us in your Son's righteousness, and you having removed our sins from us and taking them far away. And as you have raised our Redeemer, we look with anticipation to the day that has been promised that is ahead of us, where we are raised, glorified bodies, with you forever. May we be found doing then what it is a joy to do today, to sing praise to your name, to thank you for what you have done, what you have accomplished. Lord, May we, your people, be a blessing to you. In Christ's name we pray.